I almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs> That's how important we are, David. We almost forgot. Uh, Tim almost no, forgot. I, I, I don't even remember your name, Tom, until it's up on the Zoom, you know. <laughs> how you doing, Tim? You look like you're in a dungeon somewhere. No, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm in a hallway. <laughs> That's sort of. Um, I'm at home now. Oh, okay. All I'm right. not really, I don't do much of this. Soon. And home so, is in Brooklyn? Is this correct? Yeah, yeah, Gowanus. Uh -huh. Gowanus, okay. Well, welcome to the show, David. Our guest is Tim Byrne, in case you haven't realized it. He is a uh, recording artist. He's a saxophonist. He's a performing artist. He's a composer. He is a label owner, and we're going to talk about what exactly a record label is. I don't think some of our younger listener knows what a record label is. But, uh, Tim, when I went to research you on the internets, on the Wikipedia, it says avant-garde. Hey, Yes. Can I interrupt you for one second? Uh, sure. A, a package just arrived. It's oh, go new... get your package. Tell us what it is. One, um, one second. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it must be nice to have a house with a hallway, David. It's true. You know, I'm... Uh... Well, you, you're, you, you live in, in, the, in Woodbury, the cozy confines of Woodbury. That's it. All right, folks. Well, and last night, uh, Tim Byrne is checking his mail. Stolen. All right, I'm here. I'm here. What happened? What's that? You got your package. No, I said the last shit out there gets, stuff gets stolen around here. So. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so it's not it's safe to live in Gowanus, is what you're saying. Oh, no, it's not. Not for packages. People, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> People are fine with packages. Well, to continue, I saw on the um, Wikipedia, your Wikipedia entry, that it, it lists you as an avant-garde mm -hmm. jazz saxophonist. David, why, Tim? What? Why do they have to put the word avant-garde in there? Does that mean he? Does that separate him from the rest of the jazz world for some reason? You talking to me or David? Yes. Well, the, either yeah. one. Um, me, I don't know. Good question. Okay. I want to make sure I. My audience is limited to a, a handful of people. I, I'm not really sure that that's a it's a tricky question. I mean, I was once asked. I was on some panel, and they asked me how I wanted my music. Oh, sorry, Jesus! How I wanted my music promoted, you know, for a concert or something. And right. So I just tried to explain that it was good to just try to just describe the music rather than give it a, a name like free jazz from new york for example right is currently used which pretty much guarantees you're going to get about five people <laughs> that and, many. and you know i'm a jazz living you know what i mean it's 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 not really that accurate because no one really knows what any of that stuff means and what it means to most people when they say free jazz it means that's something we definitely don't want to go see or hear <laughs> and um <laughs> I mean, you know, in general, I'm just generalizing. Yeah. Well, Tim, I don't, you think know, my I, music, I don't think my music could be described with one, one in one way. I mean, I certainly wouldn't know what to call it. So, I mean, it, it just limits, it's just lazy. And it, you know, <clears throat> I've done enough gigs where I know there, there are a lot of people who like this music who probably would think they wouldn't like it if they saw those labels, you know, and so. Yes, I agree. You know. It's kind of limit, you know, it's self-defeating. And of course, everybody got in a big argument and started getting mad at me for saying all that. But the truth be told, uh, Ken Burns really destroyed this kind of music when he did his documentary on jazz because he became witnessed. And unless you Who did? Were suit, Who did? Uh, Ken Burns, do you remember the uh, oh, right. jazz documentary? The, right, the one right. thing that was left out was, quote unquote, avant-garde music, because I'm sure Winton told him, oh, no, 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 we can't go here. Uh, if it's electric or if it's avant-garde, it's no good. But I must tell you, um, I, I have a caveat. First time I saw you was right. back at the Knitting Factory. Uh, I think it was you, John Zorn, and Dave Sanborn on stage together. Uh, you remember that? I do. Yeah, it was a great show. I used to play with Sonny Chirac, so uh, 
I'm I'm used to five people being in an audience. Right, uh, right, right. And when they say free jazz, I think they mean that no one gets paid. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's another mm. another uh, issue. But anyway, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, go ahead. I'm sorry. Finish. I was going to say you, you you can't really pigeonhole what you do. Uh, yeah, you know, I've been following you uh, actually since Fulton uh, Street Mall, and you know some of the things. Okay, they're uh, all acoustic. Uh, some of the things are with with electric bands and stuff. So right, you're right. not really pigeonholed into just one specific area. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, you know I don't really care. I don't find it. It's not insulting. I think it's more about. Specifically about if you're promoting a gig, I would think you would want as many people as possible to come. And I think a lot of people make up the audience's mind for them because they have a limited, you know, they just don't like it or they don't. Um, yeah, I, I just say, you know, I see I get tons of reviews that are positive that will always end with this is not for the faint of heart, which means, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just code for, yeah, you probably wouldn't like this, but this is pretty good, blah, blah, blah. And I, I don't know why they do it. And it says to me either they don't like it or or it's just that kind of attitude that really, um, yeah, it just makes it difficult. And I think people, you know, I like playing for audiences that don't know who I am or don't know the music or haven't been told what it is. I think you get the most interesting responses. And I'm pretty confident if I'm honest about what I'm doing, most people will get something out of it. I mean, like it or hate it, who knows, but they'll, they'll find it, you know, interesting at, at the least. And and a lot of times we'll be blown away. And then afterwards they go, Hey, what kind of music is that? You know? And, and that's the, <laughs> the best case scenario for me. You know, the thing of just selling it is, you know, free jazz or avant-garde jazz or blah, blah, blah. It's just kind of, um, yeah, it's just limiting, you know, and I, I don't think it's really accurate in most cases. And, uh, you know, I know if I saw that, it would change, you know, I would definitely get a, I would form an opinion that wouldn't be accurate. You know, if someone says, oh, free jazz from Austria, I'd go, oh, yeah, okay, I know what that is. But in fact, it could be completely, you know, inaccurate. So yeah, anyway, yeah. that's... Well, it's just, it's interesting when you see the term avant-garde, it brings up, you know, it conjures synonyms, you know, uh, uh, experimental, ambient. And the the odd thing is, is when you look at American music, since we are American, um, going back to the 50s, when 40s and 50s, when jazz was America's music, jazz is, by its very nature, experimental music, even if you're playing standards. You go into the rock era of the 60s and 70s, who were the biggest artists, who, who had the most... Uh, box office who had the most fans bands like the Grateful Dead which were very, which were completely right. experimental King Crimson was experimental Soft Machine was experimental and they were embraced by millions of fans here and, and, and in Europe you look into the 90s with Lollapalooza and Coachella well who were the biggest bands there the jam bands the Fish and Dave Matthews and 311 um, you know the prog metal guys uh, who all mm -hmm. who, improv and experimentation is is the foundation of their music. So it seems like when the mm -hmm. masses are exposed to this, they will embrace this music. It's not yeah. really it's not really so much the fringe. It's almost like gosh, pop music's the fringe because when you go to a pop music concert, you you know what to expect. If you go to a Rihanna concert or Billy Joel concert, you know what you're going to hear. And for certain parts of the audience, I guess that's okay. That's what they want. They want to hear their favorite record played verbatim or nearly close to it. But it seems to me, uh, over my life as a musician, I'm 63 now, it seems that experimental music or jazz or improvisatory music is really the, the, the form of music that's most embraced. It's not, it's the mainstream that's really sort of off. Well, <laughs> it sounds good on paper, but I mean, in audience wise, <laughs> I don't know if that's true. But, but, you, but yeah, I mean, yeah, but, but it's what you, you know, can... the thing is, when you start talking about this stuff, for every, you know, I find whenever I do a workshop or something, I'll start saying something and immediately I contradict myself like 50 times. Yeah. Because every example, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, that's true. But then, oh, but wait a minute, but that's yeah. not true. And, I mean, it's just hard to talk about it. I think that's the, 
if there's a way, you know, there's a, I think people just aren't that curious and now it's gotten, you know, it's a little bit more difficult because the recording industry, you know, the whole idea of making a record and selling it's almost obsolete, not quite. It, it is obsolete. Yeah. 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 Well, it's close. I haven't given up yet, but, but yeah, it is, it is getting worse and worse. And the value put on music is worse and worse. You know, I do most of the gigs I do now in the past year have been past the hat type gigs. Sure, that's what New York is is now. Well, at least where I play right now. And I've yeah. never done a lot of those. I've done them and I've never been very good at it because, you know, in addition to now you have to promote your gigs yourself, which means social media. Oh, we know all about that. There's no, yeah, there's no jazz press and newspaper press. Right. And uh, and then you also have to collect the money. <laughs> you know, and then you got to pay everybody. So, I mean, it's it's it took me a minute, you know, there was one gig. I, the first time I did it, I, I played at this bar around the corner every Thursday. And the first gig I did happened to do really well. You know, I had like 100 people and it was great. And then about 20 minutes after the gig, I realized I forgot to pass the hat. I forgot to say anything because I'm so used to just, you know, sure. somebody mows me some, a couple hundred bucks, whatever. And so I, at the last second, I said, oh, shit. Hey, guess what? You got to pay, you know. And of course we got, you know, we got some money, but we probably would have cleaned up. And so now every week I go in there and, and the second I set up, I get this, you know, picture, empty picture and make sure it's somewhere where I can see it. So I don't forget. Right. You know, and and uh, it's kind of hilarious, but, but it's sort of a new, a new thing. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, at first it's humiliating and it's and then after a while you just kind of go well fuck it that's that's what it is you know if you yeah. want to get paid you gotta ask for the money you know and same thing with records selling records you know it's humiliating to go on social media every week and go hey i got a new record out blah 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 hey i got a review you know whoop de do speaking but of records you have to do now you're a label owner you started off you, you started off in the 70s as a label owner when that actually meant something yeah but we'll we'll jump ahead do you think, given that streaming is now the predominant form of music delivery, and right. I have to say, Spotify knows me and does a pretty doggone good job of creating playlists for me. Right. Is the album format obsolete, in your opinion? Uh, well, the answer is probably yes, and and my to me, it's a no because mm -hmm. I keep making them, so I must be pretty. I'm pretty thick, but um, and okay. stubborn, but. I like doing it. I mean, it's one of the most, it's the one thing you can control. I mean, it's, right. you can't control whether you're going to get a gig or not. You can't control whether someone's going to buy a record or any of that stuff, but you can wake up and say, Hey, I'm going to go make a record. And if you can pay for it or you have a place to do it, or you have people who will record with you or you have some music, you mm -hmm. can do it. You know, no, nobody can stop you. That's why I started a label. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to study with someone you know, with Julius Hemphill and he right. had his own label and that was my model right from the beginning. I was like, oh, great. You can just do it yourself. And I saw it as a positive thing. I didn't see it as a last resort. Right. Right. So I was quite lucky and it was much, you know, it was really cheap to do it in those days. And you could sell records, even as somebody an unknown like me, I could sell a thousand records and right. make my money. Back. You know, so, and, and again, the important thing is I saw it as a, I saw it as a positive thing. Like, great, I can control my, my destiny. Here's this guy who I think is a genius, who I worship, that he's doing it. So he, sure. if it's good enough for him, it's, I, sh I should be able to deal with it. So I didn't even think about labels until much later when it was like, oh, I think I'll, you know, you need the endorsement maybe to get gigs or whatever. Sure. Um, but <clears throat> I've always gone back to doing it myself because I don't know if I'm a control freak, but I like being in control of my destiny i don't like having someone else tell me what they think i should do or what mm -hmm. what my music sounds like or what they think the cover should look like or blah 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 who should i play with not that that happens with me but but it's you know if i if i get an idea i act on it you know i don't want to i don't want to sit there and have a meeting and then talk somebody into it and then schedule a recording in six months and then wait a year you know and, and roll out the press and blah, blah, blah. I just want to make the record and put it out, right? you know, and work with the people I want to work with and, and choose the art and work with the artists I want to work with, you know, and it's, I love it. I mean, it's so much fun. So 
I'm going to be, they're going to have to fucking shoot me before I stop doing this, you know, because I just can't. And I still sell records, you know, I still sell physical records. It's, it sucks, but it's still enough to, to um, warrant doing it. And I, I, I just get so excited. Like today, yesterday I got a new record in the mail, you know, and I still look at the package and it's, it's like the highlight of, you know, it's the greatest thing to get a new record, sure. look at open it up and go, wow, this looks great. You know, and, and then you kind of move on to the next one. And uh, it, that's a real, that's the, you know, that's one of the great things, documenting your music. Right. Well, we are you know, the, the download album thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and the download thing works. <clears throat> I mean, I sell way more downloads than I do physical, but, and it's not terrible. It's just hard for me to get used to that, 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 I think we've David. Are you there? David, hello. Okay. Freezing. No one has ever been able to explain it to me that it, where it made sense. Why does ECM stream? You know, why do they give the records away now when they used to sell, you know, sell more? Why do they push streaming? I don't get it. Do you? I think ECM's doing it because of the presence. Uh, you know, you're getting pennies and pennies, right? They're well, not getting they, paid. There's no yeah, doubt about it. Universal music. Music is paying. Oh, Universal, sure, but yeah, that's why they're doing it. They have a license and deal. But 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 why a small label would do it, who's not getting paid by anybody, who's just you know the distributor. I know these distributors will tell you 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 have to stream, else we're not going to take your record. Right. And so why do they do it? You know, yeah. what does it? It only hurts sales, right? I mean, how can it help your sales? Doesn't help with promotion. You know, I. I'm, you know, you can get my, you know, you can fucking get this shit on YouTube. You can, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a fascist about it. You know, I use iTunes. I, of course I access, I'm looking for some weird out of print record. I can find it on YouTube. You know, I'm not, I do it, you know, like everybody else does, but, right. but it's just eliminated a, yet another, you know, outlet. And now gigs are a little scarcer and, and, um, you know, it's it's the odds are not in our favor, but but again, I just I have to make records. Else, I'd really it'd be like giving up. Yeah. You know, right? right. <clears throat> well, you know, Tom and I think about the regionalism of areas, and you know, back when you were doing the Knitting Factory and stuff like that, there was a real thriving downtown scene. Uh, mm -hmm. Post COVID, uh, a lot of those clubs have closed. And those that are open, uh, or, as, as you say, it's a pass the hat kind of thing. Uh, but when, when Tom and I think, in, and in terms of rock music as well, it, you, you almost have to develop a regional area where you're going to be successful. I know you went down to Philly, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was, a, that was an anomaly, but that was great. I mean, yeah. I'm happy about what I'm doing. I, the pass the hat thing is just a... I mean, I'm I'm doing fine. I'm playing four or five times a month within three blocks of my house with with a million different people, all people mm -hmm. I want to play with. I'm actually having a great time. I mean, other than the fact that I'm making way less money than I've ever made, right? I, I'm playing way more. I'm playing in, you know, I'm playing in New York. It'll probably I'll end up playing in New York, you know, 50, 60, 70 times this year, which is way more than I ever play in New York. And people come, you know, anywhere from 30 to 100 people. And and uh, I'm playing every week and I'm writing because I have gigs and, and I don't have to travel, you know, not that I don't want to, but I mean, it's just not happening. So I'm not, <clears throat> it's actually great. You know, if I, could, if I was making, you know, money from it, more money, that would be great. But I'm really happy to be playing locally. I think I enjoy playing way more when I'm home. I can warm up. I can, you know, take a nap. I can eat whenever I want. You know, it's, yeah. it's amazing. This is actually what I've always wanted is a steady gig somewhere where I can just go in, 
set up on the floor, no PA, you know, bartender, everybody likes the music, is happy to see us. And, you know, you get five or 600 bucks at the end of the night, pay the band. Everybody's having a great time. It's heaven, you know. It's just not a great business model for a <laughs> eight-year-old, you know. But but I love it. I'm, I'm absolutely, the last three years have been among the most productive ever for me in a really strange way, you know. And and I have a label that's super supportive that's crazier than I am, this, this label Intact. It's okay. putting out two records a year. So I'm really lucky. I mean, I, compared to most people, I have a lot of opportunities. You know, whether I made them myself or not, I'm doing stuff, you know, so. Well, you Actually, you have a new record coming out with a, a guitar player, correct? Or is that well, just... Well, it, it just came out. It's actually Mark Ducre record. He's playing my music, but I'm not on okay. it. He's a good friend of mine from, I met him back in the late 80s. And he made this beautiful record, but but I have another new one coming out uh, next month with uh, Hank Roberts and Aurora Neeland, who plays uh, accordion and clarinet. Hank plays cello. Mm -hmm. But I have this label that's super supportive, and, and they're, this guy's out of his mind. He's just like, "What do you want to do next?" You know, he lets me do the covers. He lets me produce the record. I mean, it's amazing. It's it's uh, you know, and he's young too. So I mean, this could have you know, this could last for a while. Wow, <laughs> but, I mean, it's I'm so anyway. I'm not. I'm definitely not complaining. You know, I'm. I'm uh, I have stuff to look forward to every week. You know, music wise. Yeah. Well, and well, so what you were talking about, you know, like the Knitting Factory sounded sounds great when you look back on it. But in fact, I was playing way less in New York then than I am now, because you know to book a gig there, you had to book it months in advance. Right. It was, super competitive because everybody wanted to play there now i have a situation where the bartender i just text him and say i want to play next thursday and he goes great and no one else is going to play there so those days so i basically from eight to ten it's my bar you know whenever i want it on thursday so it's oh, better, way weird. better than the old shit like hey how's june you know 2013 <laughs> uh well monday at noon you could do a set you know <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was very, I mean, it was really hard to get gigs. Tonic, all places, man. It was fucking hard. Yeah, it's a different world back then. I mean, totally. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot going on, but. There's but, a lot going on. There's a lot of, you mentioned it. Yes, there was a lot of competition. But, you know, I was playing in Europe and I was doing right. tours back then. So, so I had outlets. I didn't really need to kill myself in New York, but now it's sort of the opposite. Right. And, I'm, you know, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. It's well, odd because I was doing better at the 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 new or the newer uh, or knitting factory number two because I would do a something downstairs and I do something upstairs on another yeah, yeah. night and things. So it it was a uh, a, a better time. Yeah. But, uh, the old knitting factory, the the original. Uh, my wife was living on first and first, so it, it, oh, yeah. it was it was great for me. Uh, yeah. I've but, never lived uh, in Manhattan, so like when you say downtown scene, that's like me. That's like a foreign country. <laughs> I, was in yeah, I grew I'm up in on Sixty Eighth and Broadway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've 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 been in Brooklyn since seventy seven, and I never was part of that scene except that I played at the Knitting Factory. You know, right? Mm -hmm. right. So when people said, you know, John Zorn downtown scene, I barely played with those guys. It's just that one period where I played with John doing the Ornette stuff. And you know, yeah. friends and everything, but but really, I was I was sort of on another. I was just kind of in my own world out here and playing with you know people in Brooklyn and 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 just making my own little scene, you know, you know, with different bands and stuff. Now I'm playing with way more people than I ever have, you know, because everybody lives out here. You know, nobody lives in Manhattan. Right, that's and very so true. Brooklyn is the musical center of New York now. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's really. Um, like I can do sessions. I mean, you know, everybody talks about no one wants to do sessions. It's not true, you know. I mean, I can play with people every week, established people, young people. You know, if you're if you're up for it and you have a place to play, it's it's fucking great, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you have the energy, you know. I mean, and people want to work on music. It's not just you know, hey, let's jam, and you know what I mean. So it's. I mean, I feel like I'm getting better in different ways now than I was back then when I was gigging, you know, going on tour and doing all that stuff. 
and playing with the same people, you know, same band and trying to keep it together. And, and now I just, I don't really have a band and I just have all these different things that I do and music that I can play or not, you know, so. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll take us back to the beginning. You started your journey as a player later, late in life as a, as a college student. And then you, and two years later, you were in, you were on the scene in New York. What were those years like, 72 to 74? Well, I started playing really in 74. Okay. And then 70, I mean, I did my first gig probably in 78 or 77. Okay. Um, but I started taking, I was noodling around probably 73 in this college in Oregon. And I had these crazy friends who were all musicians in high school. I was, I was going to Lewis and Clark college in Oregon and okay. I met this crew that was into the, you know, similar kind of music as me. And they were, they had all played in high school and then just played for fun. And they were all pursuing other things in, in college. And, and I, um, I started playing cause I, I was playing intramural basketball and I, fucked up my ankle and coincidentally some guy was selling an alto for a hundred bucks. And since I was into music, you know, I was way into, you know, I used to, I lived in Syracuse. I used to drive up to New York and go to slugs and go to studio Ribby and all mm. these places. And I was, a, you know, it was like following sports for me, you know, I was so into it. And so I got this alto and I just started farting around on it because I had a lot of free time. Um, and so I met these guys and we would go, We'd, we'd hang out and, and probably, you know, get stoned or drunk or take acid and then play. And there were all these great places like that. We'd play in the chapel at the college, or we'd go out to this swimming hole and play outside. And we'd do what we call jams. We'd right. just say, hey, let's do a jam. And we would jam and I'd play with these lunatics and I didn't know what I was doing, but, but I knew how to, I kind of, I think I was able to identify when something was happening. Okay. Music, you know what I mean? even though it was very simplistic, I could tell there was some kind of magic happening when it was happening. And I got used to playing with people and I was so naive that I didn't realize how ridiculous it was. And, and I got into it and, you know, I used to play with records and you know, yeah, I just Farrell okay. Sanders record that I jammed with every day, you know, cause everything was in F on the alto, and was, <laughs> yes. you know, and, and, <clears throat> And then I decided, you know, sort of quietly to myself, maybe I should pursue this. You know, I wasn't thinking about my age. I, I just thought, well, here's something I actually really want to do. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to go to college in New York somewhere and take lessons. And coincidentally, in 1972, before I went to college, a friend of mine and I um, decided to get jobs and, and then make enough money to go to Europe even though we had no idea what that meant, but neither of us wanted to go to college right away. So my father believed, let me do it. I mean, he basically, he said, well, do you have a plan? And I just made it, we just got drunk one night and came home and said, yeah, we're going to go to Europe. And he said, oh, okay. You know, and as long as I had the money, he was like, okay, I guess that's a plan. I was shocked. I mean, I thought he was going to say, what are you fucking crazy? You know? <laughs> so, so we went to Europe and it turned out to be a really interesting trip for me because I was very anxious about not knowing what I was going to do with my life. You know, I was really mm -hmm. worried. I was just going to be some schmuck who didn't know what to do and took some job that he hated and lived out of some boring life. And so I was desperate to figure something out. And then during the trip, I kind of went off on my own and I kind of got into my own head for a while and trying to sort that instead of just having fun, you know, I was actually stressing about what the fuck am I going to do? Right. And I went to Paris because I knew that Braxton and all those guys were living in Paris, Art Ensemble. And and so I was kind of looking to see if I could find where they were. And I found I ran into Braxton and he was practicing in this place called the American Center. We had a really nice conversation and I'm sure he was thrilled to have a fan, you know, an American in the middle of fucking nowhere. who yeah. actually knew his music. And so we talked and then. He gave me his address and we kept in touch. And then when he came to New York in 74, he agreed to give me a few lessons. And uh, I took a few lessons with him and then he got busy. That's when his career kind of took off with the Arista and all that. And so he 
he said, why don't you call Hemphill? And I was like, I was a huge Julius Hemphill fan, but I didn't know he lived in New York. I just thought he was in, I didn't know where he was. Mm -hmm. It was just this name. And he said, why don't you call Hemphill? And I said, Hemphill? You know, and he said, yeah, he lives in Brooklyn. And so he gave me Julius's number and that's how it all started. I took lessons with him and, you know, he helped me. I mean, he just did every, I mean, you know, he turned me on to just all these different long tone exercises and, Mm -hmm. and, Talked about composition, even though I had no idea what I was doing. He was very encouraging, very matter of fact. And then and because he wasn't, wasn't doing much, we would hang out all the time. You know, we'd do a three-hour lesson, and then we'd go to juniors and have cheesecake and sit around and talk. And oh. <laughs> I kind of, you know, I was I was sort of privy to the trials and tribulations of, of what I would probably end up going through 20 years later, okay. you know, dealing with a musician and you know, on the fringes. And, and, and so I got to see it firsthand, you know, I helped him with his label. I helped him organize gigs. I did all the things that I do now back in the seventies before I could barely, you know, do anything. And so I learned all this stuff. That's, that's a big mystery to a lot of people. And it just became second nature to me. Oh, got to do a gig. Let's, you know, I'll rent this place for a hundred bucks, make some flyers and do a gig, you know, and get it. And, write some music and that that's what I learned, you know, and, and, you know, and I played long tones an hour a day and did all this crazy shit that he showed me. And, 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 and then he, he sort of taught me how to teach myself, you know, he didn't give me all the answers, you know, he'd always pose questions. He didn't just say, do this and then do this and bring it in. He would, you know, I'd say, well, what if I do scales? He'd go, yeah, you can do scales. What if I do this? Yeah, you can do this. And then you go, but you can make up your own exercises too. And they go, oh, okay. So mm-hmm. if he had said, you know, climb a tree upside down, I would have done that. You know, <laughs> it just so happened he said some interesting things, and I was just ready to do whatever he said. You know, and 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 he forced me to think for myself. You know, he made me kind of less dependent on on him than I would have been had he just laid out the lessons. You know, right? Symmetrically, okay. Okay, do C scale this, this, then come in next week and then we'll do this. And and you can't do this yet because you're not good enough. You know, he never said shit like that. You know, I was writing music the first year I started studying with him. And I'd bring in these duets and we'd play them. And he didn't say, yeah, you, you fucking don't know what you're doing. He would take it seriously and help me with dynamics. And, you know, so it was very encouraging, but it wasn't like fake. You know, he wasn't making any money. You know, the lessons were 15 bucks or 10 bucks. Right, and we hours long, so it wasn't for the money. So he wasn't like just trying to keep me studying. You know, it was kind of a mutual thing. You know, for him, it was having someone who's actually interested in his music, which made him feel good, and having somebody to talk to about all this crazy shit. You know, that he was going through. <clears throat> so it was, I think, in a way, it was good for both of us. And then I kind of helped him get off his ass and do gigs. And you know, he wasn't really a hustler to his credit, you know, and so I would just say, Hey, let's rent this place and you can do, you know, or let's put out, why don't we put out this record? You know, I'll help you do it. And my sister can do the cover. And, you know, so I I got real great practical experience in music and everything else. And then he would just keep telling me, you got to play with people. You got to play with people because I was terrified, you know, Mm -hmm. so a lot of good advice. And, and, and that's what got me started. And then, you know, you, you can't really, I mean, I think you have to have you have to need to do this in order to do it. Right. Like you, when I tell people what I did, it sounds like I'm talking about somebody else because it's not me. I'm not a pushy person. I'm not confident. I'm not cocky. I'm not a hustler. But I needed to do it, and the only way you can do it is to do it yourself. Ninety nine percent of the time, you might get lucky. You might be one of those people who gets discovered, but for the most part, you got to do it yourself. Exactly. And you can't feel, yeah. can't feel sorry for yourself. You can't get competitive and bitter, even though we all do. You know, you just got to go. Well, okay. So no one's calling you, so you got to you got to make it happen. You know, you got to do a house concert. You know, I still do house concerts. You know, but but you can't look at it as something that's demeaning because I mean, it's not a it's not an exact science. You know, we're lucky we do something that's that we get right. so much out of, you know, so 
if I if I go to a job nine to five, it's easier, but it doesn't necessarily bring you you know a lot of pleasure. Um, and it's a very predictable life, and and the you know the freelance thing is a nightmare. But um, if you need to do it to you know, then you'll figure it out. I think. Yeah. Um, I guess. But it was great that you were put in a sort of a an apprentice situation which yeah, totally. really doesn't happen much at all certainly anymore. not in certainly not in places like berkeley or university of miami i mean that's that's the best music education you that anyone could possibly get you learned on the job <laughs> well ironic i'm gonna be devil's advocate here yeah. I, to, I don't want you to think i'm a contrarian but <laughs> i think all of it's good i mean i think yeah. it's it is what you get out of it you know if you go into it saying oh music education fuck that yeah, yeah then it's gonna well, drag. Yeah. but Julius used to fucking beg me to go to music school. He's Is like, right? you, should to, you should go to Boston. You should go to New England. Yeah. You'll learn how to play in an ensemble. You'll get all this practical experience that you need. And I almost did it, but I didn't want to give up my loft. I had a cheap loft in Brooklyn. But, you know, so I don't have a, I think these a lot of people who don't get shit, get anything out of it, they don't put anything into it. You know, you right. can't expect a teacher to tell you everything, you know, what to do with it. They can get, they're just giving you information. You know, there's, there's no bad information. It's just information. You take it and go, oh, well, I like this. I don't like this. Maybe mm -hmm. this will help me. You know, those guys like Julius and Arthur Blythe, Oliver, they all said the same thing. Take the gig, any gig. You know, Arthur Blythe was doing mariachi gigs. Julius was doing fucking crazy shit. You know, they never said, yeah, you don't need to do that shit, you know. You know, the, the kids who say, the people who say that are these little kids who say, I'm not going to do weddings. I'm not going to do this. You know, it's like, great. But if you put something into it, the worst, stupid, shitty gigs still get something out of it. Right. But if you go, you know, so I mean, yeah, music school, I mean, maybe not all the teachers are, are great or for you, but but you do have a choice of what to do with the information. And, and everybody's getting the same information, basically. Yeah. You know, there aren't that many notes that, that no one's making new notes up. They're just putting them in different orders. You know, you listen, and everybody has a theory, you know, you listen to Henry Thrag, he'll talk about it, and he's like, don't try and scrap, you know, you gotta, whatever you're gonna play live, that's what you gotta work on, you know, and if you work on John Coltrane solos, that's what you're gonna play. That's true for him, yeah. you know, but I bet you there's some people who did that where where they also are have their own thing, you know? So, I mean, he's, that was the thing with Julius, there were just never any absolutes. He never said, this is the way to do it. He would say, yeah, you could do that, or you could do this. And it was much harder because I really just wanted him to tell me what to do, mm -hmm. exactly what to do. Sure. So, I mean, I'm sitting, I go home, and I tried 50 million different things because I was so confused. You know, I'd be like, hey, can I play scales and thirds? He goes, yeah, you could do that. And then he'd go, why don't you make up your own shit? And I'm like, okay. And then, and then you come out across somebody else. They say, why are you doing that? And like, uh, I don't know. You know, and then eventually you say, fuck everybody. I'm just going to pick a, you know, you can't do everything. So I'm going to do this. And then when I run into a wall, I'm going to pick up something else. And that's how I operate now. You know, I, whenever I get in a rut, I make up a bunch of exercises and then internalize them. You know, and well, it's amazing you, you say that because I went to Berkeley for uh, three semesters. And the two things that I felt most uh, that were most important for me was this bookstore right across the street from Berkeley called the Bumblebee Bookstore. Right. And they had all this incredible material that was part of the reason I left Berkeley early. Uh, I was reading a Schoenberg book and my yeah. harmony teacher at Berkeley said to me, oh, you're going to get confused with the Berkeley way. And I went, what's the Berkeley way? Uh, and that was interesting. And then the very next day, I brought a four horn chart in uh, where I was using flat fives. And they said, you shouldn't use flat fives until this semester. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and so, but besides the Bumblebee bookstore, I met Charles Benakis, yeah. who was just one of the most gifted, loving teachers and it, it as, as Julius was with you, he sort of gave you all these options that really made it so much more enjoyable. 
um, right, right. you know, and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, do you mentor anybody now? Well, I'm super, I think I'm super generous to when I give lessons and when I do workshops and stuff. I mean, I studied to be a teacher. That was actually what I thought I was going to be like an elementary education. That was kind of my study in college. And I, I think I'm good. I'm a good teacher. I'm not sure I have all the knowledge, but, but I'm very good at getting people to get the best out of themselves or to, to want to do this, you know, and, and inspire people and, and just how to not discourage people. You know, I don't do the tough. Yeah. You suck. You can't play. You got to do this. You got to learn every tune and every key. You know, I just know how to deal with people. And, and, and I am super generous because I remember what it was like. You know, I remember all those cats were so cool with me for no re for reason. I mean, you know, they didn't have to be. And, and uh, so I do try to be, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I mentor anyone. I usually discourage, I, you know, I'm playing with a young guitar player and, you know, I try to get these guys, you know, especially if they're way into my music, I try to convince them to, to stop and, and just start figuring out their own shit, you know, and, and not so much, you know, how everybody wants, you know, for a while you want to copy your heroes. I think right. it's good to stop. I think it's good to stop listening. I think it's good to, clear your clear out some space for your own ideas you know yeah. not a big deal i mean it, it doesn't there's a million ways to do it that's what i had to do i had to stop listening to all those guys julius threadgill and and figure out what i was hearing you know because i was hearing julius it was just like a drone and i was copying everything you know trying to copy him and all my tunes still are modeled on what he did you know and what a lot of those guys did braxton and but I had to stop, try, you know, I just had to go cold turkey and it, and it helped me. You know, I kind of figured out what, what, you know, I found out what was in my head. And even though, you know, none of it's original, at least I, I'm not aware of what I'm cop as aware of what I'm stealing as I was then. And, and so it helped me just find myself. And I, you know, I just tell people that, you know, it's great that you're into my music, but you know, those writing things that sound like mine and, I just kind of go, yeah, you just got to stop doing it. You know, fuck it. Do your own thing. You know, <laughs> you have your own ideas. This is working for me, but then, you know, this guy's doing this. Now you got to do this. You got to do something else. You know, if you want to be part of this, this scene, you know. And it's not a big deal. It's not like, oh, I got to be original. You know, it's it's not what I'm saying. It's it's I got to have my own voice. I think right. that's a, yeah. it's an option. It's not that hard to do, but you got to commit to it. You've got to it's a little scary because you're not copying somebody. All of a sudden you're you're coming up with your own idea about what you want to sound like. And uh, you know, when you have all these great options, especially guitar players, you know, like he, you know, this guy, Greg, that I play with, you know, he's into Ducray, he's into Frizzell, he's into Torn, he's into this guy, you know, and it's cluttering up his brain. And I'm just like, Yeah, fuck all those guys. You're great, you can play, you know. Now you gotta find your own little yeah. thing you do that they don't do, you know, and, and, uh, it's a, it's fun, you know, it's not a, it shouldn't be a, a big deal. It's just, you've got to, it's kind of like breaking out on your own, you know, it's like becoming an adult. Um, <clears throat> and it's honest. But, what? It's but, honest. Yeah. And you know, that's what, what you're in it for, you know, not everybody is, uh, is me. Not everybody wants to play, you know, so-called creative music or, write music you know that's the other thing i mean people ask me about composing i just i just say man just patience sit there and do it just like when you practice if you don't practice composing you're not gonna nothing's gonna happen you know you have to take it seriously it's just work it's not inspiration you know there's no yeah. lightning rod that comes down once in a while it does but most of the time you have to sit there can't practice you got to sit there maybe for hours before anything happens. But if you don't stay in it, you'll have to reset. You know, I think, you know, like when I decide to compose, I have to fucking, it's like psychoanalysis or something. You know, I have to really psych myself up and, and then I, I cannot practice. You know, I can't, first thing I do has to be composing. Otherwise I, I just, I get distracted, you know, or I lose with the momentum. You know, and so it's they kind of look at me like, is that it? And I go, well, 
<laughs> you know, if you can come up with a better one, that's fine. But I've never done it. I've never been able to do it any other way except to by doing it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You know? And it's work. I mean, you can't can't wait around for some shit to hit you. You have to look for it. You know, and then you get used to doing it, just like practicing. If you do something every day, you know, if you sit down and make something up every day, it gets easier, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, good stuff, yeah. But I don't know. Well, we discussed that, you know, it's know. getting back to the fact that, you know, recorded, we can no longer record, you know, monetize recorded music, or it's yeah. it's not what it was, uh, even, even at yeah. point of purchase. Yeah. Um, two people we've interviewed we've had on the show, one, uh, Larry Grenadier, mm -hmm. and another guy by the name of Colin Blundstone with the Zombies, mm -hmm. um, started doing streaming concerts. And Larry did a wonderful show from the Village Vanguard, uh, just a solo bass. The, David, this was during COVID, I think. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it was right. great. I mean, it was, you know, you. I think there was a pay scale. It was $10, and it was the sound was beautiful. The visuals were beautiful. And I was like, wow, I could... You know, I could get into this. Now, of course, I live in New York, so I have access to the Vanguard. But I was thinking, gosh, there are people all over the country that will never get to the Village Vanguard. And yeah. and and what a great platform this is. A few weeks later, we interviewed Colin Blonestone and Rod Argent. They did a show, a streaming show from Abbey Road. And again, you went into Abbey Road and they did things that they couldn't do on the road. They had an orchestra with them. They had special guests. And I think, David, what did they charge? I think they charged maybe $15 for two hours with Argent. And I thought to myself, wow, with so many venues closing and touring becoming prohibitive, because not only is it expensive, you know, the liability, the insurance, yeah. it's harder and harder to travel. You see what's happening to the airlines. What are your thoughts on streaming becoming a, a viable platform, not only financially, but artistically? Well, I did I did some streaming concerts. A couple were successful. Yeah. The most successful ones were the ones where the quality was high and somebody spent some money and the recording right. sound was good. A lot of them sounded terrible. Yeah. And nobody really a few people bought tickets, but they didn't do that well. Right. One did pretty well. And then I realized that's when I got deep into the band camp thing. I said, okay, well, I can do this at home. There you know won't necessarily be a visual component which is pretty boring right. anyway and and i'll make a a good sounding recording and sell it for ten dollars on Bandcamp, and i'll sell a few hundred and you have it for life it's a recording mm -hmm. you know you don't just look at it on your computer with with varying sound right and it's kind of like a really inexpensive record um, and for the artists, you make way more money doing it that way if you can record cheaply. And, and I've done recordings on my phone, you know, where I just go up my bedroom and and I get my friend yeah. David Torn to master it and it sounds good. Yeah, or I right. get, you know, I pay somebody 300 bucks and they come over and, and we make a really nice recording or I record a, a concert and sell it. I think it's a better option for me because I'm more concerned. I'm not so concerned with the video. I'm concerned with the sound and when right. i see these streaming things and i listen to them and they sound like shit they don't sound as immediate as it feels right because either because they're close mic'd and so it just sounds dry and doesn't sound like the room you're in mm. or the balance you know it's it's just that you know the quality in general was pretty shitty and i would always get really bummed out like well that's not you know it's like watching youtube or something mm. you know where the, where the camera guy's sitting behind the drums or something and <laughs> And so at the beginning, I was sort of into it. And then I did a few concerts where they also streamed them, but we would, you know, we'd, we'd make money at the concert. I just felt like the streaming thing, I think it works for some people. Like right. Frizzell was doing shit from his house and a ton of people would watch it or, or Chris Potter did one and a million people. But it was hard to monetize it, I thought. It was hard to get people to pay for it mm -hmm. in my world. And, and, and then, you know, half the time the thing would end up on YouTube for free. And, you know, um, I just felt like the quality control wasn't great, you know, and right. it's probably, because, you know, I wasn't doing it at the Vanguard. And, and uh, so I kind of lost interest in that pretty fast. But then I started doing, uh, I mean, I must have made, I bet I've put, I've made 40 Bandcamp records since the pandemic started. And 
and they all did okay and, mm-hmm. and I paid everybody and it's usually from a gig um and and it it got some momentum you know it was i felt like i was doing gigs almost okay you know, i put one up it was like oh this is cool this is an event you know a couple hundred people will listen to it buy it and at the beginning a lot of people you know me and david made these solo records at home and we did really well you know better than we ever did on ecm hmm. because we kept it at low cost you know and it, that when i discovered that at that point in the pandemic i became really productive and motivated i started writing a lot I, and we we kept brainstorming okay let's do this let's do that then i started putting out all these you know i save all these dat tapes from years ago and i started putting out live wow. gigs and you know and paying everybody and and it was very cool you know it was sort of like okay once again we found a crack in the system it's not over yet you know what i mean because <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean every five every five years ago oh this is over oh no more cds oh no more concerts no more <laughs> You know, and then you kind of, and then I'll go, okay, there's got to be something else we can do, you know, mm-hmm. and you start talking about shit like podcasts or this or that. And usually for me, it's the thing that that's the least technically demanding. Right. Because I just don't have that. I mean, I have a really great way with really limited technology, but when it comes to like, hey, let's do a podcast. I'm like, oh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> or Or let's record, you know. You know, somebody wanted me to record on their record from home. I don't I don't use a computer. You know, I don't know how to do that. Mm. I do everything on my phone, you know. So so I'm really into finding these, you know, like when I started my label in the 90s, the whole idea was live recordings, two track, you know, two microphones, bootlegs. Right. Because I everybody loves a bootleg. Mm-hmm. And it worked for about eight years. It was wildly successful. I was absolutely correct. I made the covers look really funky. We had this great cottage industry going. It was really fun. And then the that streaming guy, whatever the fuck it was, that first thing, what you know, that you know, those I forgot what it was yeah. called. Well, the guy, you go back to Napster back. Yeah, in the yeah, the Napster thing. Mm-hmm. And then that and even then I didn't even know what the fuck that was. So I thought, ah, this is no big deal. And then and then my wife kept saying, Yeah, this is gonna end this shit. Watch. Because she was, you know, she was writing ECM and and all of a sudden she was right, you know. Yeah. Like three years later, my sales went from a few thousand to like 800. And I was like, whoa. You know, and I would spend, I, I knew exactly how to make money. I could, I would spend this much on the record. I'd pay everybody this much. I'd, I'd figured it out to a T and, and we'd always make our money back. And it was easy as shit, you know, and it was really fun. And it was like a big fuck you to the record industry. <laughs> yeah. I loved them, you know, and then you go on tour and sell hundreds of records and it was great. All of a sudden it was getting harder and harder. And then now it's, I don't even bring CDs on the road. It's like, you can barely give them away, yeah. you know? And, and so now I'm just scratching my head. Okay. Now what am I, I'll figure something out, you know? And I was talking to someone, you know, me and I'm friends with Bramford Marsalis and we were talking about doing a bod- podcast, not so much for career reasons, but just for some, it's sort of a way of being in front of people, you know, right. Feeling like you're connected. And, and that's why I do Instagram. You know, I put up these Instagram videos just so I feel like I'm doing a gig, you know, I get one, I'll be practicing and I'll just go, fuck it. I think I'll do a five minute video right. so I can perform. And I, I don't, you know, I don't do takes. I just do it, throw it up and forget about it, you know, and people respond because it's honest and it's, you know, it's something, you know, cause now I don't travel. So, I mean, for people to see you out of town, you know, all they have is these records and, and, uh, you know, stupid YouTube videos that, that usually sound like shit, you know, for some reason. Yeah. yeah. But um, anyway, I'm, you know, I'm blabbing. Well, I think that, yeah, I think the, you know, David and I were streaming, we talked to Ron Carter about it. He did a, one or two streaming concerts, but it just was too much for me. He says, I need a live audience to feed off of. Yeah. Yeah, I can't do that. But I, I suspect as the technology gets better, just like who would have thought we're doing Zoom right now? OK, we would be doing yeah. this over a telephone three years ago. And I think I think the streaming uh, platforms, th- there will be certain programs specifically for music. And yeah, I think it's 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 going to be a viable uh, option for for musicians who can't tour. Yeah. 
and then for people who don't live in a major city because you know i live in new york city in new york city you know i'm on the upper east side and it, it's really emptied out a lot yeah. of businesses have gone under you know brooklyn you have a young affluent uh population to at least from what i've seen uh, and of course, downtown NYU owns downtown, so everybody's, you know, pretty affluent down there. But for the rest of New York, you can see, you know, the the evergreen businesses, the dry cleaners, the bodegas are gone. You yeah, know, the yeah. brick and mortar retail's gone. I there's there are no hardware stores in my neighborhood. If I need a screwdriver or a shower curtain, I've got to go to Jeff Bezos. So, yeah. you know, so it's you know, I could see where yeah. the the video platform. Again, having to be monetized, but with the right technology, it could be a viable. Um, yeah, but yeah, the monetizing is the hard part. It's hard yeah. to get people to pay. I mean, now it is. Yeah, it I is. It really the, is. The first year of the pandemic was different. Everybody yeah. was like, it was such a novelty, and everybody was so excited. Wow, live music finally. And they were still getting oh. their salaries. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it was. I mean, it, it worked, but yeah, all right. You know, I could even do it. Like, I, I have a nice room to play in where if I had the technology together and we did a steady thing, a live thing once a week, right? That, it would be great, but, but it's a lot to do manage. And, yeah. and I'm still not sure people would pay, you know, I just don't know. Yeah. That's the hard thing. And I think that's, that was one of the damning things about Napster because I always, and you know, I I every interview we've had, you know, I said, well, you know, I always felt the responsibility to pay for music. If I didn't pay for the music, if I didn't buy Ian Hunter's new record, there wouldn't be another one. Yeah, yeah. And what's another, what's eight bucks, 10 bucks for a record? What, yeah, no, yeah. Well, everybody go out and have a beer, you know. <laughs> but I, like I was at this gig the other night, I was just trying to make the point, you know, with this past the half bullshit, like, hey, you know, you know, you're paying $10 for a beer. You know, because some people put think they put five bucks in. Oh, it's, it's amazing, yeah. And then they go around the corner and go to iBeam, which has no windows and no bar, and pay 20 bucks. You know, so I'm like, you're in a really nice bar. Drinks are cheap. There's windows. You know, yeah, you've yeah. got space. Can you pay $10, you know, $15 that you would pay anywhere else? Right. If they were charging that. You, know? you go to the Stone, it's like going to a mausoleum, and they pay 20 bucks. You know, yeah. so... You know, this is like actually, you know, you can talk. I don't give a shit, you know. You can have a good time even if you hate the music, you know. It's a <laughs> exactly. Good deal. And and it's weird that you have to explain that. But but now I just I just turn it into a big joke, you know, it's yeah, like it a is. comedy routine. And yeah. it seems to work, you know, but but um it is, you know, I can't imagine Ron Carter doing that or you know Well it is yeah you have to be pretty, you know. And you know, he could do a streaming thing and make I mean, I I agree with him. I mean, the no audience thing. If you're not in a really nice sounding room, like even the Vanguard without an audience, it's sterile. Yeah, you know? yeah. But Larry and, told us it was very spooky. I just saw, yeah, yeah. I mean, I saw some of those, and you know, it was weird. It sounded very. It sounded like it looked. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Sound. Yeah. I'm not talking about the music was good, but it. Right. Unless you have an amazing stereo and you have your shit hooked up, it's. You know, it's like watching well, that's really the other thing. It, yeah. you, you, you've got these computer speakers. I mean, they, they were exactly. meant for for music. I yeah. also think people, after the two years in in, in lockdown, they want to get out and see things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they just don't want to pay for it since they're so used to the YouTubes and the, yep. the right. iTunes and this and the other thing. And then TV took over. You know, everybody now it's like, can't get anybody... Right. You know, they're, oh, no, we're watching our show. We can't, you know, we can't go out. <laughs> I mean, I, I get it. I do it, you know, but but I'm just lucky, man. I'm, if I didn't have this steady gig, I'd be bitching and moaning right now. I'd be freaking <laughs> No, I'd be freaking out. I can't practice and not play, you know. Yeah, yeah. I can't sit around and practice all day. And go, oh, I got better today, I think, you know. Yeah, what's the point? Yeah. yeah, you know, it's 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 hard to stay in your head all the time or or just make records, you know, it's, I really enjoy playing in front of people and, and it's changed my, it saved my life. I mean, this bartender, I told him, I said, man, you saved my life. And he said, mm -hmm. said, you saved mine. So <laughs> it's just like sitting here with the same fucking 12 people, you know, watching the Knicks game. So he <laughs> loves it. He's like, he doesn't care if they make money. He doesn't care. 
It's the perfect storm. But we'll promote your next gig. What's the name of the uh, bar? It's called Lowlands. It's uh, in Gowanus. It's on okay. 14th and 3rd. You don't have to hang out, David. I play there every yeah, Thursday at 8. I'm playing there this week with Tom Rainey and this guitar player, Greg Belial. She, you know, it's just on my, I mean, if you're on social media, I'm, I'm up there. So I'm okay, there. good, good. I put these things up all the time. But it's really every Thursday. All right. Uh, okay. And then Barbez, that's four blocks. So I have to go four blocks for Barbez. <laughs> Tough life. <laughs> really five minutes earlier, you know, it's a bigger commute. But um, <laughs> that's kind of it. I mean, it's amazing. It, it's uh, definitely saved my life. I mean, that's all in the last year. But, you know, it. it uh, yeah, it's great. Every week I'm like, oh, shit, got a gig this week. All right. <laughs>